Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us today for the first of three Craig seminar events. Firstly, I ask that you all mute yourselves and turn off your camera if you haven't done so already. On behalf of Caval and the Craig seminar committee, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands ac across Australia and New Zealand where we live, learn and work. We acknowledge and celebrate the inherent strengths of Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander and other First Nations peoples and communities and recognize their continuing connection to land, water, sky and culture. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. This morning we have two 20 minute presentations by leading experts in open educational resources followed by a facilitated discussion. If you have questions for the speakers throughout the session, please ask them through the Slido link which is in the chat and slideshow. You can also go to slido.com or the Slido app and use the event code 78863. I'll probably say that again, 78863. Before introducing the speakers, I want to thank the Krieg Seminar Committee for their hard work in putting this webinar series together. Although the seminar this year looks very different to other years, we have delivered a lineup of speakers that is as strong as ever, so thank you. Our first speaker is Dr. Rajiv Jangiani. Rajiv is the Acting Vice Provost, Teaching and Learning and Associate Vice Provost, Open Education at Kwantlen Polytechnic University in Vancouver, Canada. Our second speaker is Dr. Sarah Lambert, who is an Honorary Research Fellow with the Center for Research in Assessment and Digital Learning, or CRADLE. Our facilitator today is Frank Ponty, Manager Library Services Teaching at RMIT University. We're delighted that the three of you have agreed to be a part of the session today, and we can't wait to get started. So thank you, Rajiv. I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you very much uh, for, that, uh, for, for that welcome and introduction and acknowledging country as well, Jamie. Um, as Jamie mentioned, I uh, live in British Columbia in Canada, um, and I work at Kwantlen Polytechnic University. Uh, KPU is located on the traditional ancestral and unceded lands of the Kwantlen, Musqueam, Keitsi, Semiamu, Suwassen, Kikate, and Kwakutlam peoples. But like most of you, I'm joining you this morning from my home, which is located on the traditional ancestral and unceded lands of the Squamish First Nation. I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen. And then we can begin. All right. Well, it is really a, a pleasure to, to be with all of you uh, this morning. I know it, it was about a, a year and uh, almost like two years ago at this point that I spent some time visiting different institutions in Australia, digging into what the context was in higher education. Uh, and I know so much has changed since then, but it's great to be back, uh, back and, and have a bit of a discussion with you today. Um, so I wanted to, and this is sort of a brief presentation, but I wanted to dig into uh, a broad question concerning um, access for who? Uh, we often talk about importance uh, of access, certainly within academia, but within libraries in particular. And I wanted to pull a few threads uh, of, on the premise of, of, of access in particular. Uh, and in doing so, I think we'll address a little bit of the promise, perhaps, uh, and including the potential, the untapped potential yet of open educational practices. Um, just a quick note that the presentation itself, the slide deck, I will be sharing that, but it is available. Um, it will be available under an open license as well. But briefly, I mean, I think many of you will know this, uh, but uh, many of us assume that when we talk about education in general and higher education in particular, uh, we don't question the assumption uh, that access is a good thing. And indeed, even if you look at Article 26 of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it concerns the importance of equal access to higher education. Uh, but of course, as you well know, in practice, uh, higher education is experienced quite a bit differently. Uh, sometimes this is because of, in North America, issues like legacy admissions, where those who have attended university before, uh, their children are more likely to be admitted, uh, are given reserved or special treatment uh, as they access uh, higher education. In other cases, it has to do with the hidden curriculum uh, and the generational mm -hmm. knowledge that is passed on uh, from those who have attended to their children, uh, information and knowledge um, that of course is not available to those who've been excluded up to that point. And in most other cases, it has to do with affordability as well, uh, right? So an affordability can mean many things. 
Uh, I know the last time I checked, this was uh, about a year ago. I haven't seen updated statistics yet, but about a year ago, even in your country, um, and when I say your country, I know there's some Kiwis here. So I mean, Australia, outstanding help debt had exceeded $67 billion about a year ago. So certainly affordability is not something that, that's foreign uh, to even your shores, that conversation. But overall, I think when you, when you consider these pieces about who is permitted to, who is permitted in, who is really welcomed in, and what barriers, visible and invisible, are actually uh, able to be uh, circumvented, uh, um, then I think you start to appreciate more and more just the many ways in which higher education really, despite its mm -hmm. promise to be a vehicle for economic and social mobility to, to unlock human potential, it really in many ways serves to replicate and reinforce existing power structures. Uh, and of course, there's many pieces to this, but one that we are going to talk about a little bit today has to do with affordability in course materials and textbooks in particular. So I'll give you a bit of a, a North American perspective on this. And I'll start with what is now a very famous chart. Um, this depicts, this is from the, the United States Bureau of Labor Statistics, and it depicts the, the change in prices of, of many consumer goods uh, or over the last 20 years or so. Uh, but one of those lines, as you'll note, has to do with college textbooks. Um, interestingly, the Bureau of Labor Statistics began tracking these data back in 1977. And if you look at 1977 to, to the present, certainly costs rose by more than a thousand percent. But you will also notice that over the last couple of years, uh, there's been a bit of a plateau. Uh, this is the so-called open textbook effect uh, in North America, which I certainly hope will have a similar impact in Australia uh, after not too much time. Um, but despite that plateauing, uh, certainly over the last 20 years in, uh, by itself, inflation, as you can see, was about 59.6%. Uh, but uh, when you look at the rise in the cost of college textbooks over that same period, it was three times the rate of inflation. Uh, in fact, about 179%. So what is very commonplace in North America are snapshots like this. Uh, students walking into college bookstores at the start of every semester and sharing, tweeting out photographs of their receipts, showing the world how much they're being asked to spend on expensive commercial textbooks uh, semester upon semester. Here's a student in British Columbia. So you'll note the hashtag says textbook broke BC. Uh, spent $620 in, in, a, in a single semester. Here's a student in Alberta, next textbook broke AB. You can see this is very much a national movement. Um, she says that she could have spent that money on rent. And here's a student from Saskatchewan, textbook broke SK, who says that he just spent $750 on textbooks and that he'd rather spend his money on food. And food is a good thing to bring up because, of course, when we talk about the cost of textbooks, the price of textbooks, uh, and the monopoly of textbooks themselves, it's useful to see what the commercial publishers have been up to. So here's an interesting uh, excerpt from an interview with the CEO of one of the largest uh, commercial textbook vendors, uh, Cengage. He wrote a couple of years ago that there are millions of students out there who are making very painful trade-offs in the purchase of learning materials relative to paying the rent, paying for basic needs, food, etc. Acknowledges that we as an industry have chosen for a long time to basically ignore that or have more or less been paying lip service to them. Really, I, mean, I think it's quite staggering if you look at the sort of uh, how blatantly he's acknowledging uh, their business model and the exploitative nature of it. But I share this in part, not because, not just because, I mean, I think this is uh, really a self-own over here, uh, but because food insecurity in particular has become an increasingly important issue uh, at university campuses across my country, across the United States, certainly. But there's often also because there's a connection over here, a parallel. Just as students cannot easily say, for example, uh, that they're not going to pay their rent, and so they end up, you know, not choosing this sort of a forced choice to starve themselves. Same way, they can't say that they're not going to pay tuition, so they end up choosing to do without uh, the required course materials in a given university course. And in, in North America, the conversation is very much pivoted from the question of affordability is often answered with a digital solution. Certainly commercial vendors have approached it in the same fashion, where they talk about digital textbook delivery platforms. Uh, and certainly many of us will uh, point out the many ways in which these platforms are very much wolves in sheep's clothing. Certainly, if you consider, for example, that students never buy the books in these platforms, which means they can never resell them, recover any of the cost, they certainly lease access, which means that they cannot retain the resources for further study, even if they wish to, 
let's say they take anatomy and physiology in first year, they plan to go on to medical school, they're going to lose those resources after eight, nine months, for example. And of course, it's an especial nightmare for accessibility with digital rights management, copying, pasting, printing, all restricted within these platforms. And so we've been doing quite a bit of research to understand the state of student textbook buying decisions. Here's a snapshot from a couple of years ago, I guess three years ago at this point, uh, in which we knew that uh, a majority, a slight majority, 54% of students across 22 uh, British Columbia institutions were not purchasing at least one of the required course textbooks because of cost. Uh, and as you can see, uh, just over a quarter were either taking fewer university courses or not registering for specific courses because of the cost of textbooks. Hardly an approach that you would endorse uh, if you're hoping for the best, uh, uh, for hoping for students to be able to achieve their potential in higher education. The data south of the border in the United States are considerably worse, of course, where affordability is even more of a serious problem. Uh, and over here, you can see data from a survey in Florida. Uh, this has been repeated a few times, most recently, in fact, uh, in 2018. Uh, the data in front of you are from 2016, in which you can see that two thirds of the students over there were reporting not purchasing at least one of their required course textbooks because of cost. And again, that's how the sentence ends in that survey. And it's about the same uh, at the moment as well. Um, but I will say, you know, over the since this survey was done, one of the things that has changed uh, quite a bit is not just that the cost of textbooks has actually finally plateaued because so many people are uh, using adopting open textbooks, uh, but in fact, awareness on the part of faculty about the problem of textbook affordability has risen quite a bit. Uh, this is not something that would have been the case a few years ago, uh, but in their most recent survey, uh, Inside Higher Education indicating, this is a nationally representative sample, that 82% of faculty agree, either somewhat or strongly, that textbooks and course materials cost too much. So certainly the message seems to have gotten through finally. Uh, we are often suffering with a bit of a principal agent problem, uh, right? where the agent who makes a decision that other people are bound by uh, is not really aware of the consequences of that, uh, or the, 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 the cost of the textbooks that they assign because they never had to buy it in themselves, for example. And these are all factors that were in play before COVID. Uh, I know in Canada, we've been looking at this quite seriously in terms of the financial impact on students through COVID, the inability to, to, to be able to continue with employment, uh, using up savings, uh, their fears about the loss of jobs, taking on student debt and being able or being unable to keep up with bills and payments. So all of this is to say that the factors that were in play earlier have really been exacerbated over the last nine months in particular. So this is why I think many of us work so hard to, to try and, and further to leverage open education, uh, which of course in many ways is a philosophy about the uh, way, a belief about the way in which people should share, build on and exchange knowledge, right? We work to eliminate barriers to, to access to knowledge, uh, whether this is legal me mechanisms that inhibit sharing among scholars and educators or whether it's uh, affordability as well. And within open education, of course, uh, many of you are focused on open educational resources. Uh, and of course, if you don't know what those are, I'll just say that these are really any teaching and learning resources uh, that have been published with an open license. And by open, we often talk about a Creative Commons license. The Creative Commons license really means if you're talking about a textbook or a simulation uh, or uh, you know, uh, any other kind of resource, really video clips, uh, anything, images, uh, it's free for students, but for, for in many ways, the power of open educational resources come in the freedoms uh, that go along with open licensing. Right? So we often talk about the five R's of open, in particular, the permissions to reuse, revise, remix, retain, and redistribute. Now within uh, these five permissions, of course, this means that we have the ability to reuse these resources freely, uh, that we get to adapt them to our local context, that we get to mix them, combine them as we like, that learners get to keep them forever, and that we can distribute them to students and they to their friends and communities as well. In British Columbia, we're very, we're very lucky to have the British the BC Open Textbook Project, which is managed by BC Campus. So certainly since 2012, we've been pouring a lot of energy into developing uh, and adapting open textbooks, hundreds of them at this point. 
Uh, there's also been a fair bit of research that's looked at the efficacy, the impact on educational outcomes. And overwhelmingly, they tend to say the same thing, which is that students assigned free and open textbooks tend to perform the same as, or when they perform differently, better than those assigned expensive, expensive uh, commercial textbooks. And one of the things I love about OER is that just as you had the most marginalized students, right? Students of color, first generation university students, those who hold student loans, who tend to disproportionately suffer uh, when it comes to high textbook costs. With open educational resources, you see quite a bit of evidence that those same marginalized students disproportionately benefit, for example, with the use of OER. Uh, here's an example of a study that, that shows this with um, uh, improved course grades, uh, improving at even greater rates uh, and uh, decreased uh, D, F and withdrawal rates, so sort of indicators of uh, poor outcomes for students, all showing greater outcomes uh, for students who are, who are underserved, who are part-time students and who are from lower socioeconomic status backgrounds. Uh, now at KPU, we do quite a bit of this, of course, uh, and I'm going to really whip through a very quick summary to give you a sense. Uh, but we do a lot of work on, on textbooks. Uh, we have Canada's first zero textbook cost programs. At this point, students can choose from uh, over 850 courses uh, and seven full credentials, including a Bachelor of Arts degree in general studies, where there is zero textbook costs over the four years of the degree. That's about a savings of $5,000 per student. And certainly in the three years that we've been running the program, we've saved our students over $5 million at this point. As you can see, uh, at this point, actually over 850 courses, lots of instructors actively participating, uh, over 400, and of course, uh, many, many students as well. But our support for open education tends to focus on three pillars. Open educational resources is, of course, one of them. So whether instructors want to locate relevant OER, uh, review uh, open textbooks, for example, uh, we support them by compensating their, their efforts through honoraria, adopting open educational resources, adapting or creating. We support them with grants, with a publishing suite, uh, with a lot of institutional support. And here's a, a quick snapshot of our open publishing suite and a very quick glimpse into some of the titles uh, from our open textbook catalog from a range of disciplines. So whether you're talking about um, you know, from algebra to business writing to horticulture, we are a polytechnic university, of course. Uh, and so we have, uh, and we publish open textbooks in a variety of areas. Uh, we make sure that our open textbooks are also submitted to the BC campus uh, repository. So you'll see them uh, there as well. But as I, as I talk about the three pillars, I'll say that the other two pillars aside from open educational resources are open pedagogy, and open education research. And with open pedagogy, of course, we talk about uh, the use of OER in a way that goes beyond simply displacing commercial textbook cost savings. We're often talking about the co-creation of knowledge in the classroom with students, talking about replacing more traditional so-called disposable course assignments, where it's typically only the instructor who would see the, the students work and instead have students work to create OER as part of their coursework uh, that has a bigger impact, a bigger audience and certainly a longer life. Uh, and this includes, for example, a wonderful fellowship we run in partnership with colleagues in the United States uh, that focuses on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, so this is an example of a fellowship in which the students produce OER as part of their coursework that serves progress towards specific sustainable development goals, um, including in one of the examples on, on this screen, uh, addressing the issue of food insecurity on our campuses by mapping, identifying mapping uh, edible weeds on our campuses, for example. But as I talk about this, I'll maybe just point out a, a, a couple of things. Uh, one is that, you know, a lot of this work is taking place over several years. And at this point, it comes because we have uh, substantial support from senior administration. Open education is one of nine major goals that, uh, that our institution holds. Uh, our strategic planning has open education uh, woven through it. Uh, we have an open education plan uh, more specifically uh, that is also published as you can see with an open license that I welcome, uh, welcome you to, to visit and look at. You can see many of the strategies that we're deploying. But the, it has been a very intentional effort to try and make sure that this is reflected in our policies, such as our intellectual property policy, you can see over here, encourages the creation adaptation of OER, among other things. Uh, it's woven through our procedures. 
such as when new courses are developed or when academic courses come up for review every five years, each of them has to undergo a search for relevant OER. It's not mandating the adoption of OER, but it mandates the search for relevant OER. So it's an educated decision. And it's also embedded into our practices. So things like students are able to search at the point of registration in our academic timetable um, for courses that have zero textbook costs. For them, it doesn't matter whether it's OER or not, but they certainly feel the benefit of, um, of this. So as I wrap, I'll, I'll share just a few resources in passing uh, that I hope will help inform our discussion as well, which is to say that as much as we will share our practices and our planning and our documents, there are a number of other groups that share things as well. Uh, Spark is one that has an open education leadership program that particularly supports librarians, for example. The Open Textbook Network, or now the Open Education Network, I should say, has a certificate in OER librarianship. And I know USQ, for example, is a member of, the, of this network. There's a wonderful open access uh, guide, a handbook that was published uh, just recently, uh, a field guide for academic librarians that I certainly uh, uh, advise that you download as well and loads of other resources, right from a guide to marking open and affordable courses. How do you actually make this available, this visible to students? Um, how do you make sure that the open textbooks that you're publishing are not just um, can be accessed, but are accessible? It's wonderful work out of BC campus. Uh, and of course, uh, pushing things even further, how do you make sure that despite the best of intentions in open education, that you don't do harm? And so this is the, the last resource I'll share it is a more recent volume, which tries to get at a little more of a critical conversation about how can we assume, for example, that we are not disregarding accessibility, data privacy, uh, that we are ensuring uh, that uh, in the pursuit of access, uh, we don't commit uh, several injustices. Uh, and I know that Sarah is going to tap this uh, quite a bit in her presentation as well. And I hope we get into more of a discussion about this uh, as we go. Uh, but for now, I think I, I will uh, wrap up over there. And as I said, I will make these slides available later. I know I've been whipping through pretty quickly, uh, but you'll be able to browse them at your leisure afterwards. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, is that working okay, Frank? Are you happy for me to go? Yes, please proceed. Gorgeous. Well, thank you so much, um, Rajiv, for that um, setting the scene about why OER are so important and um, providing access for students who, um, particularly students who, who are underserved and already have a range of barriers, you know, this, this can make a, a real difference. And certainly in the Australian context, we have this Higher Education Act for many, many years that, that says that we really are not required to charge students on top of their of their course fees for additional materials. And so that's been a, a sort of a safety net in Australia for a long, long time and has, has provided a lot of impetus for the libraries to always have copies of uh, numerous ex extra copies of texts in the library so that students who can't afford the textbooks have, have somewhere to go. But of course, as we, we know, with the current state of digital provision, um, this has become a very murky situation where it's not really so clear cut anymore. Um, and we have so many restrictions to the sorts of digital access that this idea um, uh, that students don't have to buy anything is, 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 is somewhat up for discussion and question. And certainly um, that is, um, certainly the students that we interviewed, and that's what I'll talk to today, um, are experiencing the same uh, problems in many cases as, as is, is happening overseas. And that's certainly disturbing and something that we all need to um, get onto. So, but today um, I want to extend this conversation, not only access for whom, who, who, who can access higher education, but access to what exactly? What are we providing access to when we give them a free textbook? And I want to acknowledge my co-researcher, Habiba Fidel, who is also with us today. And we're doing this project and it's wrapping up soon. So um, in Australia, we have, Australia is coming off a low base of OER and OER texts. And um, this is a 10 year old study um, that kind of maps where things are at. And, um, but the pace of exploration is really picking up and there is a palpable sense of momentum at the moment. 
Um, and I want to just provide a caveat in talking about my research today that this is a 12 month funded project. It's, it's not a huge budget and it's impossible to be across everything. And so um, if I mention, you know, if I don't mention initiatives, it's because that we, we, <laughs> we can't be across everything. And so please do contact me with updates. But I'm really informed by the published literature. The OER SIG network of Ascolite, um, who have been our communications hub and, uh, and some members are participating and there's five institutions who are participating in the research. And so in Australia, USQ has been mentioned a few times. They've been early pioneers, showing early leadership, a lot of strong people pushing for open education, open pedagogy, open intellectual property. Um, and again, the OEP SIG um, with Adrian Stagg there is, is continuing to show leadership and they have publishing as well. UTAS was another early active um, participant. Latrobe, very active. Um, they, they have had a publishing um, institutional support for, for publishing open text um, called the eBureau, which I'll talk a little bit more about. And that their first title was published in 2017. Um, lots of unis have lib guides talking about how to locate OER resources. And some have harvested those citations and imported them into their catalogues. And I know Deakin is one that has done that. So for example, the eBureau, traditional publishing model, I don't think at this point they've used press books, but they um, might be stepping that way in the future. And I know that Stephen is here, so he can comment on that. But a range of titles, their website shows you all of them, his history, his science, his research methods. Their eBureau supports student success, very focused on the kinds of texts that can help students study um, in their particular courses. Um, key concepts in humanities and social sciences, um, a very interesting text um, on um, Indigenous culture through the eyes of um, early um, colonialists. At QEUT, um, they're doing a Pressbooks pilot this year, this very year. And so this is their web page. And at the moment, um, their, pub, their titles are still in production. And so very soon, you're going to see new titles on, on their web page, which is going to be really exciting. Um, USQ, as I mentioned, they've already been doing this for some time and their um, press books page um, now that they're the first Australian uni to join the open textbook library. When you click on, you know, look in the library, it now pings to the open textbook library. And as you can see, it's like over 806 textbooks in there. And if you go a little deeper, I just showed you an example there. The Wellbeing in Educational Context text, which is published by USQ, is, is one in that 806, which is super exciting. Um, RMIT have had this great um, textbook heroes website and that that looks at tracking the cost savings to students and also the teaching benefits so to draw back to Rajiv's presentation not only the cost dimension but also the pedagogy and how this is actually helping the students um, to get on and learn. Now another couple of things that come across my desk much more recently and this is from the traditional press or traditional monograph sort of production space and so I just um, was sent recently ANU Press's brochure and they have over 921 titles and they say that they are was the first and now the largest open access university press in the world. And they have a series on indigenous knowledge and topics, which is very interesting, including this particular text, um, which are an introduction to Gamilaray. And that is a, um, an indigenous language under threat from regional um, New South Wales in the Narrabri region. So, um, and it steps you through all the lessons. It's super detailed. It's, it's just an amazing resource. I, I literally only found out about a week ago. Um, Sydney Open Library has been doing um, open access texts in the social sciences and humanities. In They launched in 2019. They now have over 40 titles. And um, this one here, Australian Politics and Policy, really caught our attention, I think, as a network. Um, because again, it's not, it's not a sort of traditional reference book on a, on a niche topic. It's a textbook in the teaching sense of stepping students through, setting the content to particular levels of learning, 
you can drag and drop chapters and com combine to, to make your own custom text from a range of options, which is an increasing sort of platform approach to textbooks that we are seeing in our research and in practice. And I think NOBA, which is a, a platform that allows this sort of drag and drop combination, um, was come up quite early as being used in some of our institutions um, in the research in the field of psychology in particular. So it's some, a lot of activity is starting to happen. So to have a look at the research component, and that's the study that I'm leading um, and it's funded through the National Centre for Student Equity in Higher Education. And this is about open textbooks as social justice. And we have done 64 interviews, which is a lot of qualitative data. And that involved 19 students, um, two separate cohorts at two unis, one postgrad, one undergrad, um, the postgrad cohort had a high um, percentage of international students, the undergrad um, mostly external studying, so um, fully online a long way from the um, delivering campus and a mix of, of local external. So we also spoke to 45 staff at those five participating universities. And so not just um, key staff in libraries, e-learning, leadership and policy and their understanding of what open textbooks um, their vision for that and their policies and their support and their practices for that. But also those OER adopters, adapters and authors who are rolling up their sleeves and adapting them, uh, or actually more likely authoring in our context, actually we found, and those that have adopted them within their courses, often as a sort of, um, sometimes a first step, just um, well, we'll, we'll, we'll give the students a choice between the commercial one and, and the open textbook. And then lo and behold, um, they're mainly using the, the open textbook. All right. So um, if I was to very high level kind of look at things, I'd say um, Deakin and RMIT, you know, doing a lot of adopting and adapting and monitoring, sorry, adopting and monitoring OER and really starting to, to um, ramp that up. Latrobe and QUT within our study are both um, supporting institutionally the actual production of textbooks. So QUT, as I mentioned, is, is doing the Pressbooks pilot. Latrobe has been producing since 2017. So we've spoken to authors out of that pool of staff. And at Charles Darwin Uni, we just did a really focused case study with a single um, academic who's done a major um, unit design that has adapted OER with students. So we've sort of tried to cover the gamut of practice in this rather um, uh, large scale study. We also did a national online survey of teaching staff where we, we sent out through a range of our digital networks. And of course, it being COVID, we couldn't do any of our normal dissemination <laughs> through conferences that we'd planned. So it, it's been quite challenging, but in the end, we were able to get over a hundred responses there. And those data have been very much more your mainstream app, app academic. We promoted it as a kind of, tell us about your digital textbook practice. So we scooped up a range of academics who have not got any particular pre-existing interest in OER necessarily. And that, that sort of replicates the methodology in a UK study, which we're hoping to do some comparison with. And so the research question is this, to what extent do OER texts have the potential to act as social justice initiatives in the Australian ed? higher education as they do overseas. Now you've heard quite a bit about um, the North American Canadian context and the UK is a study as well. So I just want to clarify what I mean by social justice. Um, so in this study, we're talking about three distinct ideas. And this is this is after Nancy Fraser's very influential work, which has been more recently reinterpreted um, by a couple of authors for um, open education, <laughs> um, including Cheryl Hodgkinson Williams from University of Cape Town, who is now uh, UNESCO chair of open education and social justice. So yes, there's, as I said, internationally too, a lot of interest. So what do I mean then, these three distinct ideas? The first one is, is redistribution. So it's redistribution, recognition and representation, three different R's. It's a, a kind of cute way to remember it. But the first is the economic dimension, the cost to access. Um, this is about providing redistributing resources to students who by circumstance have less. And Rajiv has provided such a, a great um, and thorough explanation of why and what that could look like. But then there's the sociocultural 
and the political dimensions of how we recognise difference and how difference is represented within the actual textbook content. So this is what I mean is what exactly are we providing access to? Whose point of views, whose cultures, whose ideas, who are we and what are we providing access to when we give a free textbook? And I suppose um, if, uh, um, if we provide a textbook that is inherently um, racist, for example, but it's free, is that really justice? And this sort of this sort of perspective suggests that not really. You, it'd be best to have all of these elements working together to provide the most just outcome. And so, I think recognition um, recognition of different types of students, their sense of seeing themselves in the curriculum, seeing themselves in the text, belonging, having a sense of belonging, is um, an important part of the literature in widening participation. But it also strikes a warning because in practice, attempts to recognise diversity can in fact reinforce more negative stereotypes of difference instead of affirming the strengths. And that can be um, not really what we're looking for. And so I think there's trends now to take a more positive approach and to try and avoid what's called deficit discourse, where we talk about students who are disabled and disadvantaged as if that's the only thing, when in fact we know that students who, who may have some things that they can't do are actually have huge amounts of ability. So let's talk about their ability, what they can do to get the assignment done rather than dwelling on you know, what they can't do. And similarly, students who are, you know, in the past talked about as being disadvantaged, what does that really mean? You know, let's talk about their complex lives, their resilience and their capability, you know. And so a tutor might say to a student who is a similar first in family background to them, I've got two part-time jobs and I've got two kids to care. Tell me how we can help. You know, it, it's a positive moving forward approach. And so, in our interviews and also in the literature, the recognition and the representation can get a little bit muddy. So the representation who gets to speak. But what I'm thinking is that really, if we can give better representation, so we have a wider variety of authors in the text, there's more likely to enable more positive recognition. And so I do think there's a, um, a, a lovely connection between those two ideas in um, the Open Textbook Project and the research too. So social justice, I think, is why these examples are just so compelling and I often like to share them. And one of them, Rajiv uh, touched on briefly, is this business writing for everyone text by Ali Crothers at KPU. Now, um, there's a lovely adaptation statement at the front of the textbook that I really encourage you to have a look on. It talks, Ali talks specifically about what she wanted to do here, improve the Canadian content, changing the names to reflect the classroom composition, using gender neutral language throughout and First Nations representation as well as recognition. And so I'm just quoting exactly from her statement here. The author also collaborated with Berna, Brenda, sorry, tripping over my words, trying to race here. Shall I slow down? The author also collaborated with Brenda Fernie, who is the president of SAM, the economic development branch of the Kwantlen Nation to produce a series of narratives that connect to the topic explored in the book. And it's, it's just lovely to see in the chapters Brenda's voice and hear her experiences and her expertise around business and writing and, and how, the, how you do that from um, the perspective of her particular business. Um, it's just seamlessly woven in. It's really great. Similarly, in the um, foundation text for a botany course there, you have um, the First Nations usage of plants um, for, for survival over the millennia. You have that seamlessly woven in. And it's in the very first paragraph of the first section of the book. So if you look at this sentence here, for Indigenous peoples, the accumulated traditional knowledge of plants has allowed them to thrive in diverse environments for thousands of years. So, um, and then it, it, it's just an authentic way. It adds to your knowledge. It actually adds to what you can get out of botany. And so it's just marvellous again to see that seamlessly woven through. And I wanna draw your attention to this, this particular paper that was published this year. And this is a study by Amy Nussbaum who, uh, has evaluated a project to diversify the OpenStax psychology text. Now, her expo small exploratory study on a cohort there um, who were provided uh, a comparison between the, the original textbook 
and the one after it had had more diverse content threaded through. And um, the impact there, so overall, first generation students had a reduced sense of belonging related to their financial circumstances. So in the course, in their, in their sense of studying, a re reduced sense of belonging. However, this effect was ameliorated for first generation students who read the diversified chapter compared to those who read the original chapter. And so at the heart of some of this reason why this is going to be a better textbook for students and why we think that it's actually going to help them um, improve on their work is this kind of um, emotional labor that um, being different has. And so if you are, and Sarah Ahmed writes about this and I have put the reference in there, there's an increased emotional effort required to fit into an organization uh, in, such as a, a university or a college if you're seen as different. And so, so this text uh, uh, are recognizing students and they're feeling a more sense of belonging. And it's, it's kind of helping balance out some of the, the um, less inclusive experiences they're having elsewhere. So I think that um, this is an area for future research, but it's looking um, promising. And so again, Charles Darwin University, one of our cases, we have Dr. Johanna Funk there teaching cultural capability, adopting and adapting an OER. She has been able to add um, four new case study chapters that were written by her students and those were part of a major assessment. And she tweaked that assessment in 2020 to give the students the option to publish their work. And of course, she's coordinated and reviewed and quality checked that and modified in press books. And this is where we ended up. Look at that six new chapters in the end because there was an introduction chapter to what they meant by uh, cultural capability and then there's four um, really ch interesting chapters on um, uh, indigenous culture and um, discrimination against Asians during COVID-19 super <laughs> topical topic um, the too strong for you Karen uh, case that was um, went wild on social media all of that has been analyzed through the lens of cultural capability in a very scholarly way by the students, a great set of resources and a great appendum to the original textbook. And so um, the research then, let's have a look at what the students said when we interviewed them. I mean, do they care? Do they care about this social justice stuff? Is it relevant for the Australian context? To begin with, and just briefly, the redistributive justice, the cost of textbooks, Absolutely, and yes, very similar sorts of results to what we're seeing overseas, which sort of surprised me, as I said, because we have this uh, Education Act and um, supposed sort of protections. And that is working still to a point, but um, there are big gaps happening. So yes, they're seriously shocked at the prices, use terms like financial burden, outrageously expensive on top of study costs. The library, the, their ability to access things to the library, when, and many of the students had a, a very really positive experience. They, they use terms like it's a blessing. For students who are not purchasing texts, even when they think they kind of, you know, they sort of maybe thought they might, but they would say, look, it's just not worth it. We don't get enough use out of each text. I had quite a few of the business students saying, look, oh, we don't need to. The professor just puts everything in the PowerPoints that's really important off the textbook. So oh, no, no need. Um, and then we had others who just were saying, look, we're only going to use it for the exam or a semester or only a difficult topic. So different ideas from different students about what makes it worth it, what is the threshold of use that makes it worth it for them. But they were generally much happier if the text is going to be used for a whole year or as a reference for a whole course. And so these curriculum approaches to open text is something I'm seeing as an emerging opportunity um, in the Australian context. And certainly they're borrowing or buying cheaper digital options, including from PDF sites. And again, um, the impact of digital licensing restrictions, we were quite surprised at how much impact the students talked about. We kind of thought that, you know, we know some texts are not available digitally, but the actual normal digital licensing restrictions that, that is so common in the Australian context where you can only get, say, you know, two or three chapters from any text, that actually turned out to be um, more of an irritant than, than we thought. And so all except for two of the 19 students, had some sort of narrative of being impacted by digital licensing. 
from the spectrum from irritation to inconvenience to actually, I'm not going to use this system. I want the whole lot. This is really annoying and I refuse to use if it's going to be restricted. And we were surprised about that. Some were forced into publishing books, especially for open textbook exams, which is a really thorny issue that we really feel must be addressed. Um, it's particularly difficult for the external students who are literally over a thousand kilometres away from a library. So if they can't get a digital thing, it, there's really, um, they're forced into purchasing a thing if, it's, if they deem it's critical for their study. And sometimes it isn't, you know, sometimes they only do need a chapter. So there is a balance, but when they really do need it, this is a big drama. And it encouraged a host of hacks or workarounds. And those who went without some or all of those texts did have anxiety that they were not well prepared for exams. So yes, we still have in Australia an issue with the economic access side for textbooks. But what about this recognitive and representational justice side of things? Did they care? Was it important for them as a student? So most of the time, many, many times, not only with students, but also with staff, they said it depends on the topic. So foundations topics were thought to be less important. They cared a lot less. Maths is just maths apparently. And foundations principles are just foundation principles. There's not a person in it. But for any of the social sciences and health were often mentioned as being very important and any of the applied topics. So all of the sciences, but later as they're applied into real world situations. So having said that, even within that caveat, most students provided examples of underrepresentation of women and Indigenous people as both authors and topics in the textbooks. And here they really made no difference. I just asked them what's missing from the textbook. And they were often talking about authors, so the representational side. So they're noticing that quite more than I thought in actual fact. Um, some provided examples of underrepresentation of Asian and non-white people or Eurocentricism. Um, Frank, how much time have I got, please? Just a couple more minutes, Sarah. Beautiful. So we had two kinds of students. Some had a very inclusive unit um, that they'd had access to a lot of cultural views. And we had another cohort that was um, more traditional that had never seen a sort of um, rep rec recognition in their texts. And really that made a big difference. So the students who had seen and had a, had seen some good examples, had a lot of concrete things to say. It's not representative of anyone. The photographs tend to be dominated by white people for a start and they don't look Australian. Most of the time, I think they just use stock photos. The content's very Eurocentric. You don't get input from a lot of scholarly material that's out there from Asia or India and there's an enormous amount of Indian work on this particular topic. Um, nursing. Nursing. Um, I had a couple of people say they really felt like it was very male orientated and they felt uh, that was really kind of disturbing because it was a clearly female dominated feel. Um, for those students who hadn't seen an example, gosh, it was a bolt from the view, blue for them. They're not used to talking about this stuff. It's really not discussed. And we, we had to enact their imagination and show them some examples. So they often said things like, oh, I don't care about that. So maybe I didn't notice that. But then as they warmed up and they reflected on their textbooks and they cast their mind back a little bit, they often had an aha moment of going, actually, this really triggers the mind as a simple example of this conversation. You know, and this is a gentleman who started to retrack and connect that he had done a unit on multiculturalism and the SDGs over here in his practice, but he'd never connected that to a critique of what's happening. But as soon as he had did that, he was able to talk about things like eventually then, if he had more diverse content, all of the indigenous examples, which he then noted were very missing, it would have, I would have been reading all of those things and it would have been normal to me. Because as a student, I think books and lectures are really, you know, they stick to the head. And this is a student who, had asked for more Indigenous content because they just get a welcome to country and they don't actually understand as an international student what Indigenous um, culture is like in Australia. So we had a lot of students, now I think about it, going back and identifying lots of gaps when they just had a little bit of time to think. Men, 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 and again, said this one student uh, and also said Nelson Mandela is missing. Another student was a little bit, uh, you know, it's, it's unfair. I think because the men, they can do really well, but I think women can do it as well as they can and mentioned there was no black people. 
Vietnamese student, he had no kind of worry about the, the lack of gender representation, the lack of women in his text. But when I asked him about racial um, lacks and, you know, what if what would it be like to see a textbook written by a Vietnamese author, he absolutely lit up. Like the energy differential was amazing. Yeah, I was absolutely excited. I remember earlier when in my first semester, I see one of the writers in the paper and actually they are my kind, my first Vietnamese lecture in the university. And so it's really interesting to see them and you know how you know their title and he means professor, that he's like going to be going on to the world. So he's seeing someone like him progressing into a, a state of success in an academic space. And he's totally motivated and lit up by that in a way that he didn't light up the rest of the interview. So we had um, also a woman with very difficult experiences, but unfortunately not that uncommon of gendered racism in the workplace. And she had so many examples, very, very front of mind took no time to give examples at all. Barely women are mentioned. It's all about the men. Even the textbook for retail management, which is a female dominated workforce, did not have many women visible in it. And of course, um, we had lots of really um, positive examples where the textbook was in fact very representative. Of course, 19 students, you're gonna get a certain view, um, but um, uh, two very separate cohorts. So I think it, it's a strong view, but nevertheless, we are also gonna present uh, in on the 17th of the 11th, the more um, those academics who are doing a great job and, and some more positive examples of um, Australian staff actively working to diversify their content. And indeed from our survey, just a few bits of the data from the national survey, 94% interested to adopt in the future, which is amazing. 88% would use open text if they had institutional support. 73% interested in adapting for Australian content, great to see. 67% interested in adapting to diversify content. So just a little bit under diversifying for Australian context more brief, uh, broadly, but not by much. And 66% interested in being part of the community. And so just to finish, what can the library do? There's so many powerful actions on this stuff, right? So firstly, look at this excellent example. Show examples of OER text with the diversity woven through it. So if you're going to spend five minutes showing them an OER, why not show them one that's that's got the diverse uh, approach? Keep the focus on the students, of course. Remind them about the stats and affordability. We've seen a lot of that today. But also remind them about the cultural diversities of their own cohorts. I think we could be offering a new service within Australian libraries to review the reading lists for diversity because reading lists are just a huge thing. They're, they're often got lots and lots of bits and pieces, chapters, whole text, journal articles, media. Why don't we offer a service to actually review those and think about the diversity of what's represented there? And is, is it the best for, for um, what can be presented? And help universities connect the dots between their equity policies and strategies, which they all have and their aspirations for open access, OER and their digital strategies. I think we really need to help bring those policy sides of the organisation together and see they can tick both boxes when they think about doing this together rather than kind of doing one job on access and then having to come later and go, oh, well, are we going to revise it all for the accessibility? Because we're starting now, Australia, let's, let's do the two together. And so, yes, wonder to empowers activate digital, policies and diversity policies come together. OER teaching side of the library and open access research side from the library, often distinct, I think we can form coalitions and work better together. And libraries and learning teaching centres, I think we're going to see a lot of collaboration around press books. I can see uh, it's starting to take off and that's going to provide a lot of opportunities. And I will most definitely leave it there. Thank you so much, Sarah and, and Rajiv. It's so much to think about there. It's, it's amazing work that you've done there, Sarah, too. Um, before we launch into uh, questions, um, I was when we've had quite a, quite a raft of them come through, I just wanted to give a, a synopsis of, of what's been discussed. Um, and so, oh, that's great that you've got references there too, Sarah. That's I'm fantastic. I'm trying to find the non-share button and it's hidden, <laughs> under, it's hidden underneath my, um, <laughs> so I can't find it. 
Oh, okay. That's there okay. Go. There we go. <laughs> and um, I'll get onto the questions shortly, but I just wanted to give a summary of, of what you've talked about today. Um, and Rajiv, you talked about affordability being the general reason why people come to open education and the high cost of textbooks disproportionately affecting the marginalised groups in education. So the students of colour, the low SES. We talked about publishers using those open washing techniques, uh, sort of like inclusive access to promote the purchase of e-textbooks. So students are charged for the lease of, a, of an e-textbooks for a short time and those digital rights management disallow them from, from accessing the, the book more fully. Um, there's also uh, research studies in the US and Canada particularly that improves grades and decreases the rates of courses dropped, failed or withdrawn when OER is used. And interestingly, those marginalised groups are disproportionately benefiting, which is, which is a fantastic thing. I love all the initiatives that KPU have started. Um, they're so far ahead of, of institutions in Australia and uh, they're doing such a lot of outreach and a lot of um, offering academic honorariums, the grants for adoption, the adaptation um, through their Opus platform. And I think, think it's something that we can actually learn from these leaders uh, in, in Canada and the US. Um, you touched on open pedagogy, which I think is an important uh, thing um, and uh, talking about the access oriented commitment to the learner driven education. So designing those structures uh, and using the, the tools that allow students to employ that, that agency and autonomy in their learning to shape the, the public knowledge. So things that come to mind immediately are, are tools like Hypothesis where it's an open um, tool that you can ap apply against an open text you know, renewable assignments, which you, you touched on around the, the sustainable development goals, all those sorts of things. So we can explore this as well. And lastly, you mentioned all of those um, textbooks and leadership programs uh, based in the US and Canada too. So I think a lot of people will be interested in those. Sarah, your presentation was amazing actually too. Uh, you, you touched on all of the, the leadership that's going on around OER and, and those those people like Helen Partridge, Adrian Stagg at USQ, Karina Bosu, who've, who've driven um, mm. a, a lot of this discussion. Mm. Uh, and there's a lot more people uh, coming on board now. Um, you talked about how OER is also um, developed up, sorry, institutions or, or libraries have developed up these OER guides. I think we can do more here. Mm. I think we can actually uh, employ some open pedagogy examples, some exemplars, something that we can celebrate and, and show uh, to our academic staff as well. And I, I really love the, the social justice aspects of the three principles of redistribution around economic affordability, recognition, positive recognition, which is great, uh, around images, case studies, uh, and diverse, diverse points of views, and also that representation as well, uh, using the voice of the marginalised groups to be represented in, in the textbook and the curriculum too. Um, the great, really, really good examples. I really, we could, maybe we can touch on those in the questions as well, uh, but I do love the actions that you've got for us. Um, so showing examples of OER texts and embedding that diversity, keeping the focus on students around affordability and cultural diversity, providing support around the review of reading lists. And mm. there was a couple of comments in the chat around that. Yeah, I'm interested to, to see. I thought, is this, a, is this a bridge too far? But I was hoping not, so I love this <laughs> I think there's really a lot of people feedback. on board. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And then connecting those dots, because we don't, we don't connect the dots around equity, around those, those strategic mm. policies, of, policies of an institution uh, with OER and those, um, those aspirations that we have around OER. So I guess that really leads me into my first question. Um, and that's around your research. And, and Rajiv, please feel, feel free to comment as well, um, because you found that there was a lot of cases where there was a lack of gender and sociocultural inclusiveness uh, within the current yeah. textbook publications when you were presented with these, when you presented the students with these alternatives, they preferred the inclusive uh, alternatives. Can you just elaborate on why the students think that these things um, make a difference to them? Yeah, so there's three layers there and three reasons. And um, the first the first one that I think is just so important to keep reaffirming 
is because it's just fairer. The students could instantly see it was fairer and the staff could as well. It's just like a basic human right thing. You don't even need any further justification. It's just the right thing to do. And I think that's important to not lose sight of. Okay, so pretty much staff and students could grasp that instantly. There's just a fairness pub text. Oh yeah, that's a lot better. But then there's also from the students who, um, who have some lived experience of, of, of not being you know, the mainstream of, 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 of some sort of being seen as different. Those students had a whole raft of reasons about, look, could, could you make this easier for me, please? You know, and so in actual fact, what they're saying by it would be easier and nicer in some cases is because they recognise that it's not an even playing field, particularly the international students we spoke to. They really, you know, the literature and the practice, you know, shows that the experience of, um, racist hiring practices, you know, even getting into good courses, their work, their practicum experiences within the university setting, you know, it's, they don't feel um, always um, seen and included in the same way. And there's always extra effort they have to put in to be accommodated, you know, to be nice, always smiling, always friendly, you can't be an angry brown person, you know what I mean, you, you get, and so that, that, is a huge amount of emotional effort. And I've cited Sarah Ahmed's work about diversity in the end of the presentation. And she, I think, gets to the heart for why it becomes an effectiveness strategy to be more inclusive. Because for students who are not instantly included, they have to work harder. So why would we want students to work harder? They already work hard enough. Um, and we already know mental health stress around assessments affordability, moving countries to come to study or moving from regions to cities to study, you know, all of that's taxing. Why, why would we want to add another layer for them to have to fit in? And so um, by taking that away, we, t we provide a little bit of ease and any piece of ease we can provide means, means more time for more effective study. But I think the last of the third reason this is super powerful that, that I didn't expect and I'm excited to see in the data from students some of them and from staff is it is a better quality more up-to-date text so what they're saying is for me to the staff for me to teach this stuff and to be up to date I need to be including these perspectives for the students to graduate with the qualities to be able to work with everybody and to 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 understand what's cutting edge like if you're a botanist and you're not talking about you don't you don't have an understanding about indigenous uses of plants I mean how much of the knowledge are you actually missing out on similarly a, a, a you know a music study you know if you're only teaching people white western music there's a huge array of, of musics that are in the popular culture that you're going to graduate with less skills. You're going to graduate with less capabilities. So from a, from a perspective of update professional knowledge, there's, a, there's also a feeling that the student will be more professional to have that on board. So that's three superb reasons to, um, to do it that, that make it better for learning. Fantastic. Thanks, Sarah. Rajiv, did you have any comments to add to, to that? Um, not a lot. And I've been furiously trying to address some of the questions in the chat to <laughs> Thank try and you. Uh, save us Go. some time as well. Uh, but, uh, but I'll just, uh, the small point I'll make is, is, is that, you know, saving money is not the same thing as widening access. And it certainly isn't always the same thing, even remotely, as, as creating an inclusive environment. And I think one of my favorite uses, Sarah knows this, of the 5R permissions is when, for example, you're able to even change the, the, the names used in the examples in the textbook to reflect the diversity of your classroom. And speaking as someone who uh, went to higher education, completed my undergraduate and graduate work in Canada, over all of those years, I never had a single instructor of color, for example, and it would have blown me out of the water to, to even see um, an identity rep reflected in the, in, in the textbooks I read uh, that reflected anything about my background. Uh, and I think it's, it's not a lot, it doesn't take a lot, but it takes some intention. Uh, and I think it's one of those beautiful things that, that's, that's not terribly challenging to do, but it takes intention. Mm. You have to be awareness. But what I've seen from this research is I actually think the research interviews acted as an awareness raising facility. So we had people going, oh, whoa, 
yes, that's a great idea. Like it was sometimes just very instantaneous, the awareness. And so you could see the intention changing quickly. Um, and so I think that's one of the great things is, is sometimes knowledge is power, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, so I might just quickly go back to some of the questions that have been posted and hopefully um, we can answer them now. So the first one that I got here was, uh, are there any gaps in the availability of OERs in any courses at university? And if so, what alternatives do you pursue? Example, more flexible e-books, e would that? Yeah, uh, I can certainly uh, use KPU's example over here. And so for students, of course, what matters is ultimately not a definition of OER, but, but the fact that they're able to afford uh, the materials that they need to study. So we use five pathways. We use uh, open educational resources. We use institutionally subscribed sort of library resources. We use instructor created resources that are not technically openly licensed, but that they deliver free of cost to students within our learning management system. In some cases, we use free online resources, like from the Government of Canada, for example, uh, that are not technically openly licensed, but are available to the public. Uh, and then, of course, there's also a whole suite of uh, courses that require no resources at all. Uh, but I will say there's short and long term strategies over here uh, and commercial textbook publishers uh, actively um, inhibit libraries from subscribing to e-textbooks if that if they're being used in a way that that uh, uh, removes textbook costs from from students so it's not a neutral playing field at all mm -hmm. uh, and when we're doing this i think the, the long goal is very much on developing oer on on, on you may use the institutionally subscribed library resources in the short term but that's not it's a very expensive band-aid uh, and ultimately i think you know folks increasingly realize it is not possible to have a resource that's as current as OER because you can update it as frequently as you want. You don't have to wait two years for a new edition. You update it every semester if there's a new development in your field um, or one that's more localized, culturally relevant. And increasingly we're seeing collaborative projects. Uh, so it's multiple faculty at our institution often working in collaboration with those elsewhere as well. Um, and so the long game is very much a move away from a static resource that is unaffordable, that is not culturally relevant, that's probably out of date by the time you're using it six months later. If I might add from what I've observed, it's not been a, a focus of the research, but just an observation, um, USQ's course catalogue of, of uh, sorry, the catalogue of OER texts, they're, they're often on, on niche um, third year and even postgrad topics. And when we did consultation, I had a lot of academics who were interested in producing texts in that niche, niche upper level um, space and it was because there was nothing available. So in Australia, we do have um, a strong reliance on commercial publishing in some disciplines more than others. Like the reliance is very great. The relationships are strong. The, the you know, the halls are, you know, a pitter patter of the feet of representatives at certain times of the semester. But, um, you know, the big first year units, um, you put a lot of work into embedding those texts into your learning management system. You might have, we found in our Deacon consultation, you might have 10 teaching staff. I mean, we have, you know, 1700 students is not uncommon in the big first year classes. So you've got a massive number of people and a huge website with all these embedded links. It's going to take you a couple of years to transition to anything. <laughs> mm. So that's a big you know, that, that's, it'll be powerful work for those who are prepared to do it. But you can't just turn that ship around quickly. Whereas the, where there's nothing already, there's actually a different opportunity. It, there's an opportunity to dive in and get in before a commercial publisher has that space and has a sort of a place for it. Um, so the, the sort of, the 100 level has appeal for the value for students, absolutely. And I am seeing some great cases of adopting, you know, the OpenStax foundations in anatomy, physiology, chemistry and biology, which is great. Um, so th there is movement. <clears throat> and then right in the upper end, uh, I think in some of our earlier um, in USQ's catalogue, there's some, some upper level stuff that's filling a really great niche as well. So yeah, different opportunities, I think, for different disciplines and different levels. Um, but I think, um, I think it's quite an attractive proposition within the Australian general practice of having a mixed reading list that you have a core OER text, 
and then you bring in the extra bits and pieces that don't quite fit from um, your digital rights management of a chapter here and there from the commercial texts. And I'm seeing academics grasping, grasping that opportunity very quickly. So rather than having a core commercial text, actually, that you can still only get a few chapters of, have a core OER text mm. and, and, and embed some um, digital rights managed chapters around it. And, you know, why not? And I'm also seeing a great opportunity that, and I'm not, I don't know, Rajiv, is this is apparent in the international literature, we're sort of struggling to find it of a curriculum based approach here in Australia. So, uh, you know, a academic with an aspiration to write two core texts for his field, that's going to go for all of the units across the program, just two, and then they'll supplement with additional stuff. So the students have something solid, something that steps them through, something they can take with them, and they're going to do that for like the whole course. So uh, that's, I, that's, yeah. that's interesting, Sarah, because I think what's lacking in Australia is that, that infrastructure that supports the creation of this content. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to do a little bit more around um, bringing that uh, together and, and offering these these opportunities to, to ac for academic staff to actually engage with. Because uh, at, at the moment, it's very individual. Uh, each institution is doing their own thing. Mm. And if there was some kind of um, resource or, or structural mechanism that brought it all together, that, that uh, I think would increase the, the creation of these resources. I'm certainly recommending CALL as the body that becomes that coordinating um, space. So the Council of Australian University Librarians, you know, just having a representative across all of the Australian institutions. And is New Zealand in CALL as well? I'm just not 100% sure if it's I think Australasian. They may be. I think they may be. Um, so um, we, we're not big enough to be expending all of this expense on infrastructure individually. It, it's nuts for anyone. It's particularly nuts for a country the size of Australia. So we need to work collaboratively. We need to think of consortia for mm, sure. Agree. And Rajiv, did you, did you want to comment from the Canadian perspective? Uh, not not to that question. No, okay. sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm midway through answering another question. Oh, in the okay. Chat, so all right. Mind mind. I, might, I might move on to the next one. Is that sorry, Sarah? Did I? Interrupt I was just you? saying, like a, a thing like BC Campus, like there are consortia approaches that are working in the North and American Canadian context already. So that we see that that consortia are, are a really good way to go. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Um, there's a question here uh, around one issue for academics is adapting, creating OERs. Is they are rewarded for research, not teaching? Mm. Was this an issue when you addressed? Uh, <laughs> was this an issue you addressed in the KPU strategic plan, Rajiv? Um, we didn't really need to, to be honest, uh, because KPU is a teaching intensive university. There's a fair bit of research that takes place, but it's not the mandate of the institution. Having said that, our IP uh, policy certainly encourages three things. So uh, the work in OER, creating OER, um, also the public, uh, publishing of scholarly work, open access, and also the adoption of open science practices. Uh, but if you're looking for good examples, one I left in the chat is uh, at the University of British Columbia, where in fact the student association led lobbying that led them to revise their tenure and promotion criteria so that the creation of open educational resources now counts under the category of educational leadership. Uh, but for us at KPU, I mean, at this point, institutional cultures moved to a point where, you know, this reflects our identity as an open access institution and it, it enhances our reputation as a, an institution interested in pedagogical innovation. So it's not something we needed to push uphill uh, to further, even though now our structures uh, support it. Hmm. And from the Australian perspective, I found this, this very interesting because I had many uh, academics who, who don't have a background in authorship bring this up as a barrier. So there's an assumed barrier but in actual fact, um, in the interviews with authors, they um, are, are providing some evidence to suggest that the barrier may be more perceived than real. And that in actual fact, if, um, for example, the way our um, research is counted in the humanities and social sciences, it's actually not on uh, mass output. It's on the quality. It's a peer review. It's on the quality based on a sample of a peer review. So. I have yet to have someone explain to me why, if you're a Hass um, researcher and scholar and teacher, you wouldn't, a quality textbook, if it was selected through that process, wouldn't 
wouldn't count as part of the output because indeed arts and humanities have a higher um, publishing um, culture around monographs and book chapters anyway and those count. So um, I'm not 100% sure to what extent your institution and, and, and I have some evidence to suggest that the authors have taken who've written texts in the past, textbooks for, for teaching, have gone through um, promotion on the basis of that's one of the contributions within their portfolio and, and had the committee accept that. And indeed, when I'm talking to some of the policy type interviewees, they seem to indicate in the five institutions that's less, they wouldn't see that as a huge barrier at all. And, um, and so, whether or not um, it's, you know, for a small number of academics to put their time one year into doing a textbook that gets, you know, collaborated with other Australians, you know, the first leading Australian text in um, Australia's legal system with an Indigenous perspective. I mean, who's, who's not, who can say that that's not, not going to have impact? It's going to be picked up massively and you could show how it's picked up in your promotion application. And also I heard from um, the managers in, who deal with accreditation. So we have a lot of um, academics applying for um, the HEA as part of their, you know, you get that accreditation, that's part of your promotion. And they're saying, absolutely, if you if you wrote a narrative about what this text does in terms of impact for the field and the community, that would be part of the HEA. Um, no reason why an institution wouldn't support that as part of your statement for, for going for accreditation. So I'm not yet convinced that we don't have a blocking narrative that's more pessimistic than the reality, but it is an area that's tentative and would need more exploration. Mm. I might just get on to, I think there's a lot more questions here. So I like this one here. Can we start a local collective campaign like those in North America and the UK this year to raise mm -hmm. awareness about the reform uh, of ebook licensing practices? I think that's a great idea. Um, so whoever wrote that, maybe we can, we can talk about that for Australia. Um, let me see. Uh, sorry, I'm just scrolling here. There's so many. Um, so for Sarah, did your study include vocational education? If so, were there any differences versus higher education in terms of authoring, adoption, or use of OER textbooks? I only, I, I it, within the institutions, um, there was only one institution that had um, a, a blend and I spoke to one academic who had very happily over many years adopted more and more um, open resources in the IT field. And the, and the benefits for his students were, clearly that those those textbooks that were coming from overseas about how to, how to code um, were, you know, there was no um, Australian, ver you know, making it Australian doesn't make a lot of sense. It was all about having access to practical examples and solutions and lots of interactivities. And so he was absolutely um, thrilled with being able to adopt the OER because they were more interactive. They had more features actually, and um, they were more hands-on and practical and had huge pedagogical benefits for that because he claimed his, his students were not readers. He struggled to get them to read. So the notion of what a textbook is, is sometimes very multimedia and chunked it's not necessarily long extended text you see everything in the oer world and oer doesn't necessarily have to mean textbook it can no, mean it's it like can a platform all, exactly it, mm. yes and we could mm. you could produce all sorts of different things that could engage uh with with uh, students um and include diversity in, um mm. uh, of, or diverse points of views i think there's there's a whole raft of different things you could do mm. um question for rajiv we have some excuse me <clears throat> We have some academics who unfortunately aren't swayed by the social justice benefits. What other arguments for OER can we present to them? Yeah, so I, I just typed a quick summary oh, okay. just send to that particular question. But, but in general, I would say, you know, you really have to know your audience, of course, um, many ways to approach this. For some, uh, equitable access and social justice will matter a great deal. For others, the question of, uh, you know, this is evidence-based practice, research on scholarship of teaching and learning, pure student success. I mean, if you want your students to do better, it's not uh, very difficult to understand that 
you know, 30% of your students cannot access your course materials, they're not going to uh, be able to succeed in your course or if they need an access code to do, to access a, a quizzing platform, for example. So that's another. And then of course, uh, there's all of the pedagogical affordances of open educational practices. Um, I will often say, and this is true, uh, many of my instructors come to open education because of the cost savings initially, uh, but they stay because of the pedagogy. Right, and, and that's because they can do things that they could never have done uh, if they were bound by traditional copyright, for example, including working with their students. I mean, imagine economics classes where the course assignment is going into public databases from Statistics Canada, locating the latest unemployment rate, recreating the, the charts in the textbook and updating it every semester through coursework. That's research skills, graphical skills, statistical skills that are being enhanced to create the most current textbook possible. That's just one small example. Uh, and so there's a lot of excitement on the pedagogy. And then when you add that there's institutional support, take it further, institutional recognition, and you remind people that, look, and none of this is being forced or mandated. There's academic freedom. You're free to do what you want. This is how we've grown from uh, to the point where over a third of our faculty are actively participating in, in this work. But I would say you really have to understand your context, your audience, and there's a lot of strategies that people will suggest. Those are some. Mm. And I think that the, this first national Australian um, survey of, of practice of, around textbooks and their um, preparedness to, to move into an OER space is sort of suggests the very first time we've, we've asked that, you know, between 20 to a quarter to a third of those academics are just not going to be interested at any point in writing a textbook. And I personally think that's fine. You don't need 100% of people in agreement that that's what they're going to do to do the right thing, right? And that we never do with any kind of teaching intervention, any kind of teaching change. It's never have 100% of people doing the thing. But you have a, a major critical mass of people and you have a benefit from that. So from my perspective, a quarter to a third of people said, look, you know, why would I want to be doing all of that when this textbook I've had for years, I've got chapter one, it's linked into my LMS there and chapter three is linked to my LMS there. I'm really happy with that. The students can get full access through the library. We have no problems. So, you know, and I have to say at that point, those, those, those um, ac academics don't have the worst problem. If that is the case and the students are getting the access, they are not the biggest problem that we need to hit. So, you know, just do what you're going to do. But that still leaves two thirds to three quarters of academics prepared to have a crack with institutional support. And that is the good news, I think. That's a bucket of amazing opportunity. Thanks, Sarah. Um, there's another uh, question here. I love the idea of diversifying OER content, so necessary, but best done in partnership with diverse groups and experts, how to find, connect and collaborate which I guess is the big question. <laughs> it's a, I think there's two things to say, but also in particularly when I interviewed Indigenous staff, they also said it can't be just left up for us, you know, like we can't also bear the burden of diversification of your whitewashed text, frankly, you're going to have to do something. <laughs> so I don't think we can hide behind that to say we just can't do anything because I don't think that's good enough either. And I think we need to know enough. We can be informed enough about, about how to do it well based on some examples that we already have. And yes, the next step, you need long term community partnerships and a lot of mutual trust to be able to step into a space where First Nations people are comfortable to work with you. So let us not underestimate that. But that doesn't mean that, 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 that we need to stop um, doing some um, recognition work and actually doing some of the labour of at least checking, removing the really horrible negative stereotypes that we can take responsibility for right now and putting in some stuff that's pop that is currently available in the media that is more positive. We can do that right now. And yes, we can work towards those partnerships. So there's a concept in diversity work called allyship. Okay. And we need to, if we are not, uh, if we are, an, uh, I'm a white lady doing social justice, I position myself as an ally. I can't speak for you, but I will amplify your voice. So find the voices to amplify in the first step. It's not like there's nothing out there. You just need to do the work of finding and amplifying. And if you make some mistakes, apologize and move on. Just like any other teaching thing. We, we just can't get totally obsessed. Otherwise, we push the work back on the people who are already exhausted <laughs> from doing all the diversity work in, in an organization. Yeah. Mm. Um, Rajiv, did you want to add anything to that? I've got I another think I to say you. that it... Well, I think I need to say that, um, you know, I think it is important 
in, in a couple of ways. So one is what Sarah said, but to build on that, um, resources are important over here and, and the sort of the expectation that uh, not just for folks who are already marginalized to pick up again, not just the emotional labor, but the intellectual labor over here, compensate them, right? Compensate them, recognize them. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, work, uh, work outside of uh, uh, your bubble in the sense of, you know, there are many, many individuals. It's not just the same person at your institution who's always being tapped because your institution is not diverse enough. So they feature on the brochure that goes to every student's, uh, every potential future student to show them how diverse your institution is. They're on every EDI committee. Uh, no, not that same person, right? Reach outside. Um, and that'll give you a lot more feedback as well. Sorry, I'm being a little too blunt over here. There are too many examples of that particular <laughs> practice. I, I'm afraid the bluntness needs to continue from what I've been <laughs> seeing. So yes, don't ask the same person. They're already exhausted. Yeah. Um, Rajiv, Canada apparently has reformed its copyright laws in 2016, which I was unaware of. How did this help with making OER more effective? Or did Creative Commons provide these outcomes regardless? No, I mean, I think... Uh, Creative Commons is, um, and as many of you will know, works in concert with copyright, right? It's sort of on top of copyright. Um, and so there's certainly many things that are that are up for discussion right now in Canada, which is very interesting. There's a case uh, in the high courts right now about um, what fair dealing is and how that could be operationalized. The universities have been making a particular assumption and that's gonna carry some uh, implications. There's also the more recent uh, force, I think, which will be interesting to see the impact of this of the uh, endorsed um, recommendation to support open educational resources through UNESCO, uh, which affects its uh, member uh, countries, uh, which hopefully will lead to more um, legal mechanisms to support this work as well. But um, no, I think it's worked pretty much in concert with on top of copyright up to this point. Um, uh, but I think perhaps the, the, the one thing to add over here is, is there's a lot more of a national conversation about this, a lot more sharing. And so now the interesting conversations are along the lines of, you know, clarifying in the context of universities, who has the IP for uh, educational materials that you produce? How do you handle it when students are now creating OER? And how do you navigate conversations around IP um, uh, with students, particularly in a way that respects their agency? Um, but no, I don't think the, the, um, the 2016 work has particularly influenced um, the, the CC licensing. Okay. Um, and I'm afraid this might be the last question because we're almost at time, but as well as reviewing reading lists, should we also be looking at a selection criteria for our general collections and how might this work at scale? I love yeah. this idea. <laughs> Librarians, have you got the powers? And if you have, <laughs> make it so. <laughs> mm, wow. I think that's the question for your audience. It is a big question. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Rajiv, do you have any comments? Well, there's some resources, there's some approaches you could take potentially as a or heuristics you could use. Um, so I know that some of the larger repositories, BC Campus is one, they have criteria that they look at. So when they're actively soliciting reviews from faculty of, of new resources to include or not, they look at those. I just provided a link to, you, uh, to that there. Uh, and then, of course, uh, when those are actually uh, being reviewed by faculty as well. Uh, one of the nice things groups like the Open Education Network has done, and there's the second link I just provided, is they openly license the reviews themselves, uh, which are enormously helpful. Uh, they provide, if you're a librarian, you'll be happy. Uh, uh, even my institution does this. We publish uh, mark records for uh, entire collections, hundreds of open textbooks that you can import into your catalogs. Uh, and those are all published with a public domain um, uh, stamp. So I would say, look at the existing work. You don't have to recreate the wheel over here. You can avail of existing rubrics, existing reviews, uh, and of course, uh, 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 integrate the, the mark records. Um, there are huge communities over here. And one I'll point you to uh, is the British Columbia Open Education Librarians Network. I'll provide a link to that momentarily, but they very routinely, along with the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, provide support and resources to, to other libraries about how to do this. Um, so they've openly licensed their lib guides. They've done a lot of work, just build on what people have already done, I would say. I can endorse that because I did meet with them when I was there. So they're a great bunch of people to, to engage with. Thank you, Rajiv.
Um, Sarah, do you, any, do you have any final comments, both of you, just in relation to the topics discussed today or around any of the questions that you might have received? Well, I, I'm really appreciative. Um, I'm really going to, I've caught some of the chat, but I think I'm going to look at the log in more detail because you can imagine the first, you know, large, large Australian study some of the recommendations or findings are very strong and powerful coming across a lot of the data. Some of them are a little more tentative and you kind of think, oh, I think so. And there's the feedback, um, even this, this factor about, you know, are we ready for um, peer reviewing reading this, for example, you know, to getting some feedback that people think that that is a goer is just really helpful because I obviously don't want to write um, a, a list of recommendations that when they hit the sector, they go, oh God, we can't do that. So it's really important. I want this work to be, and it's funded to be practical, you know, to, to make a difference. So it's super helpful to get, um, um, to be able to have an opportunity to have this conversation with one set of really important set of stakeholders. So I'm, I'm super grateful. Thanks, Sarah. Mm. Um, and yeah, so I'll leave you with maybe two thoughts. Um, one is, you know, I do think that many of us are drawn to this work um, because we care about access, because we care about equity, right? And this is why many of you found yourself in, in the professions you're in. But I think I don't want to discourage folks for, from entering this work, uh, but I do think um, it is important to be critical. So for example, don't ignore accessibility, right? Think about digital redlining. Uh, don't assume that just because the marginal cost of replication with a, a digital textbook is near zero, uh, that everybody has access to the required technology or internet access, for example. And I know you know these things, but it's an example of how open education, if, if leveraged uncritically, can actually exacerbate the issues that we're trying to address in terms of access. Um, but the other issue is also to say that, you know, in some sense, I think it, it's it's not a it's not a wonderful thing to be sort of lagging where things could be with open education. But the benefit of this is that you can really take advantage of the work that has been done elsewhere. And so let me just issue a, a big open invitation uh, that Quantlin, for example, and I can't speak for Quantlin over here, we're very interested in collaborating as much as possible with other institutions. Uh, we are doing this right across the world on our open pedagogy fellowships with collaboratively publishing open textbooks, for example. Um, we're signing a memoranda of understanding with institutions in Sri Lanka and the United States. So please reach out. Uh, you know, we can go, uh, and as one institution, we can go pretty fast uh, by ourselves, but we can go much, much further if we do this together. Uh, so please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, and thank you very much for your questions. I hope this is just the start of this conversation. I, I just want to mention that as a small token of uh, our appreciation today, the Creek Seminar Committee and Caval have arranged um, uh, native trees to be planted by community group through the organisation 15 Trees. Um, so, uh, also, please let us know your thoughts of the webinar by filling out an online survey, which will come out fairly shortly. Uh, this will assist the Creek Committee uh, to improve future events uh, and webinars. And you can, of course, continue the conversation uh, on Twitter by using the hashtag Creek 2020. Um, finally, we hope to, uh, to see you at the next Creek Seminar. Uh, that's on Thursday, the 12th of November, between 2 and 3.30. Uh, and you can also find out more about uh, of, uh, of these events on the Caval's website too. So we hope to see you there. And thank you both once again. I really appreciate your, your contributions today. You know, you're doing fantastic work and I'm, I'm so engaged with this. Um, yeah, the, I've, learned, I've learned something all the time, every time I hear you speak, both of you. So it's been fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you, Frank, for the facilitation. And thank you, Kaval, for, for the opportunity. It's been a, a great session. Bye-bye, everyone. Absolutely. Pleasure. Have a good day. <laughs>